Hi, I'm Dr. Rick Kelly. Welcome to my channel. It's been three years since the novel coronavirus, variously called the Wuhan virus or the COVID-19 virus, emerged in China's Hubei province in the city of Wuhan. Most people are aware of how it rapidly spread during Chinese New Year celebrations and continued to spread globally as the World Health Organization downplayed its significance. Big Pharma in the U.S. and elsewhere saw a potential multi-billion dollar cash cow. Products for prevention and treatment were quickly brought to market and granted emergency use authorization by the U.S. FDA and other regulatory agencies worldwide. I think I can safely say that we all had hopes that the rise in immunity from these products, natural immunity, and societal public health measures would allow us to get beyond this virus. I had those hopes, just like many others. Unfortunately, it has not worked out as we hoped. The big pharma companies reported to the FDA how extremely effective their products were. Politicians preached universal vaccination, at least for the Western world, paid for at taxpayer expense. Some have said that big pharma was working, quote, at the speed of science, end quote. To me, the speed of science would be deliberately working, checking, verifying, and rechecking each study so that the proposed therapeutic would be as safe and effective as possible, and that the studies and data would be open and reproducible by others. It seems, to them though, the speed of science might just mean the speed of profit. Now here we are almost two years after the emergency use authorizations began to be rolled out, and we have seen that these jabs don't do what we were told they did by the experts. While they do yield some degree of reduction in infection rate and severity of illness, they don't prevent illness, hospitalization, or death, as many were led to believe. Some people who have been triple vaccinated or more are still being infected with the Wuhan virus, including the head of Pfizer Pharmaceuticals. Conversely, many that have not been vaccinated at all have never gotten COVID-19. Why is that? I don't pretend to know the answer. Now here we are in late October 2022 and a new booster has been authorized by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. I want to reference the CBC media statement from September 1st. Dr. Walensky endorsed and recommended the updated jab from Pfizer and Moderna. You can see for what age is here. They contain mRNA sequences that code for spike protein components, like the original jabs. Half is for the original Wuhan strain, and half is for an updated BA4 and BA5 variants, which have been circulating around the world and the U.S. over most of this year. Dr. Walensky says, quote, The updated COVID-19 boosters are formulated to better protect against the most recently circulated COVID-19 variants. They can help restore protection that has waned since previous vaccination and were designed to provide broader protection against newer variants. This recommendation followed a comprehensive scientific evaluation and robust scientific discussion. If you are eligible, there is no bad time to get your COVID-19 booster and I strongly encourage you to receive it." End quote. So, it's important to get jabbed to, quote, restore protection that has waned since previous vaccination and was designed to provide broader protection against newer variants. Got it. Sounds good, right? Okay, to my knowledge, correct me if I'm wrong, Pfizer and Moderna still have not released all the data from the original studies that they used to get their emergency use authorization. Well, now there's an article from Fortune earlier this week. You may or may not have heard it, but they are reporting that new variants are increasing in New York. Quote, the extremely transmissible immune evasive BQ family of COVID variants, which includes BQ1 and BQ1.1. Still quoting, together, Omicron spawn BQ1 and BQ1.1 are following the same script. 
as other previously dominant variants, like the original strain of COVID, Delta, and the original strain of Omicron, by starting a swelling in the Northeast that could eventually wash over the rest of the U.S. Fellow variant tracker Dr. Ryan Gregory, a professor of evolutionary biology at the University of Gulf in Ontario, Canada. And this was in Fortune magazine. So here are the questions I have. Is there any evidence that the new boosters will be any more effective than the original on these new variants? I'll answer this one for you. We do not know. Let me just be brutally honest. I'm really tired and frustrating as a practicing physician of being told something that I'm supposed to advise my patients that turned out to be misleading, wrong, or an outright lie. Okay, enough of that. Next, immunobridging. What is that? Why should you care? Well, it's a word that appears to have been recently coined. If you Google it or do search in the medical literature, you get very few hits, and most of them relate to types of cancer treatment. The best information I found, though, was a talk delivered to the World Health Organization COVID-19 vaccine research meeting in December 6 of 2021. I will leave a link below in the description. According to the slides, immunobridging is now being used to evaluate vaccines. And I'm bringing it up because this is what was used to gain the approval for the COVID vaccine for ages 6 months to 12 years. Traditionally, medical treatments go through years of study to evaluate safety and efficacy of the proposed intervention. Because studying a vaccine to see if it prevents infection or illness or death takes time, and in the case of young children, many, many test subjects are needed to show any difference between the test and the placebo groups, alternate markers are used. In the case of COVID, they're testing antibody response. To put it simply, it's like this. They give the babies and young children ages 6 months to 11 years a jab, and after a period of time, their blood is tested to see if they develop antibodies. Then they compare the antibody response to those ages 12 to 18. And they infer or use logic to say, yes, it will work. Well, here are some of the concerns that many people have with this. And let me stop right here for a minute. The FDA advisory panel that recommends approval of the vaccines is an imminent panel and far exceeds my expertise and knowledge. Their most recent two-day meeting is available on YouTube if you want to watch it. I'll put the link in the description below. And there's many hours of presentations that you are welcome to watch. But as I said, here are the concerns. First, and this is drummed into medical students, residents, doctors, nurses, throughout training. Children are not just little adults. A six-month-old is not the same as a six-year-old or a 16-year-old. It's well known that babies and young children have different immune responses and physiologic effects from diseases as well as vaccinations and interventions. And you cannot automatically say if it's good for an 18-year-old or 16-year-old or 12-year-old that it's good for a 6-month or a 12-month-old. Inferring that something is safe and effective or even needed for a younger group based on older group is risky. Now, since we don't have data showing that the jabs are effective compared to placebo in preventing illness, hospitalization, or death, they accepted antibody response as the goalpost. What's the problem with that? Well, we've been told almost since the beginning of COVID two things about COVID antibodies. We don't know what level of antibodies means you are immune. We were also told it doesn't matter if you have antibodies. You have to get jabbed. Well, it has turned out that neither previous infection or multiple jabs have kept people from getting COVID or if they were infected from transmitting the virus to others. Again, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer. But what is the point of the vaccine if it doesn't do what they promised? Well, that's all I have for today. Thanks for watching.